So Andrew, you're talking about narrative here at the conference, but uh, your regular work is in mapping. How do you see those two things fitting together? Uh, well, that's actually uh, kind of new territory for us at CartoDB. We think that maps are a really sort of uh, excellent tool at telling stories with data, but that only kind of meets uh, a part of the use cases. And so when we can mix them with narrative and multimedia, it allows you to do a lot more with a map. It lets you sort of take the hand of the viewer and guide them to the things that you want to show them. So it isn't just about putting a filter on your data to do an editorial and give a map, but it's actually bringing somebody right into the point you're trying to make at the moment you're trying to make it in your story. So we think that, that they go together really, really well. So narratives and maps are kind of two natural ways for people to make sense of the world. Um, what other constructs do you think of as people map naturally onto their brains and brains and the way that they make sense of the world? Yeah, so actually there's been a lot of interest lately in things like sound mapping. So putting sounds back onto a geospatial sort of tool uh, I think it's a really challenging topic actually to do it right, but I think a lot of people are interested in figuring out how to do things like that. Same with videos. The, the idea of mixing a video with a map is actually still a challenging territory, um, but a lot of people are coming up with some interesting ideas. But really it's, it's almost always about how much can you take off of the map, not how much can you put on the map. So how well can you tell a story with less data than more data? How can you still make the right point and, and be honest to what the data is saying without showing all the data and overwhelming your viewer? So, so when, when even you're, you're talking about making these constructs, it's really about making the constructs with the, the smallest number of things possible and then tossing on the other little things that make the point, like the sounds or the videos or data visualization or whatever it is. So you've come up with some pretty cool little tricks at uh, CardoDB to make this happen. Do you want to talk to our tech audience about that a little bit? Yeah, so at CardoDB we, we, um, we think that maps are, are really interesting. Obviously we're building this tool to help people that have data do data visualization and do storytelling with a map, but um, we think it's not sort of the end of the road. And so we've been kind of exploring what the next frontiers of the map are. So we have a technology called Torque, which is all about putting temporal data on a map. It was something that was very, very hard to do just a few years ago. You had to make a decision of whether you wanted to use big data and put images on a map, tiles, which is a common thing that you do with web maps, or you wanted to use small data, and then you could actually send the data to the browser and render it. But we came up with a technology called Torque that lets you do big data and animate it on the browser. Um, and so we're kind of pushing the frontier there. We're doing the same thing uh, with other types of data. So how do you show change in polygons and line strings, and how do you actually connect in big data that's streaming to a platform like CartoDB with the Internet of Things. All of a sudden there's a ton of geo geospatial data that's available and people want to be able to see it on a map. So we're kind of pushing the frontiers on how you can get it on that map and still be able to interact and explore it. Excellent. So um, just wrapping up here, what's the, what are the sort of key differences that you see between a map or even a story that people look at and see and say, oh wow, that's really cool, versus one that they can kind of build into their own mental models and maps of the world? Yeah, so I, I, I kind of touched on it in, in an earlier question that it's, it's so important to make a map but get rid of all the things you don't need. But that's actually a really challenging thing to do, right? Because your viewer may be different, one viewer to the next. And so one viewer may have one particular set of data or, or information they need on the map for them to feel comfortable with the idea that it's exploring their, or it's, it's explaining their world, whereas the next viewer may need a, a completely different or overlapping set of information. So. Um, I think it's really interesting. It's a really interesting place to explore, but, but it's really exciting too because maps aren't static anymore. You're not creating a fold-out map that you hand out to a bunch of people, but we're creating dynamic maps that you can author a new map for every viewer, which means you can give them that particular custom experience on a map based on, based on their preferences, but also this idea of, of the information that you put around the map. So the, back to the other question about the narratives, that's really important. So when I ask my mom for directions driving, she's, she's my great example because I know, her, I know her really well for this, but when I ask her for directions with driving, she doesn't, t she doesn't tell me, go down North Road, take a left on whatever road. She says, go down until you see the red barn and take a right. And so her way of constructing the world is very different. And so actually the idea of being able to put these different types of narratives on the side are fundamental to, to things like root solving, but they're also the same for telling a story with data or telling a story in journalism. It's about mixing the narrative and the map so you can reach people's brain and tickle it in these different ways together. That's really cool. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, thank you.